from labs, and so we know we're going to have to juggle both of those next week, right? So, uh, exam five we know is just going to be about cancer, right? How do we classify it? What are our characteristics of our cancer cells? So, all of this material should be very fresh in our minds. Now, if I have carcinoma, what sort of cells are considered cancerous? Carcinoma. What is that cancer? Epithelia, right? So any sort of epithelial cell will be considered a subset of carcinoma. If we compare that to sarcoma, what is that? So if we're not talking about epithelial cells, what else could we talk about? Connective tissue. So we lump all of that together as we consider the soft tissue. So it's connective tissue plus your muscle. So bone is included because bone is considered a connective tissue, right? So soft tissue all together is going to be our sarcoma. Lymphoma, what are we having cancer up here? White, so specifically lymphocytes, right? So we can't really just say white blood cells because it's specifically our B cells and our T cells, correct? So lymphoma <coughs> is going to be our lymphocytic cancer. And then how do we contrast that to leukemia? So both of those are cancers that come from white blood cells, but what's the difference? What is so, so tumor is one difference, so tumor formation, so lymphoma is usually solid, leukemia is usually liquid based, but remember these guys are cancer of your um, blood stem cells, right, so those progenitor cells. Lymphoma is when they've already differentiated into your B and your T cells. <clears throat> okay, so carcinoma, right, epithelial <coughs> tissue. We know there are going to be three subtypes. So if I'm talking about epithelia, right, what do we call our carcinoma that impacts glandular tissue? <coughs> Adeno, right? Adenocarcinoma. So adeno means glandular. So that's going to be our columnar. That's going to be our cuboidal. So if we're not talking about glandular, what else could we talk about? Squamous, right? Now there's two different versions of squamous carcinoma, right? We could have squamous cell carcinoma, which is basically any sort of squamous cell affected, typically stratified squamous, um, or we could have that basal cell carcinoma, right? So it's specifically stratum basal. Okay, so we actually already mentioned this. So adenocarcinoma, right? So the actual epithelia for adenocarcinoma is going to be our glandular cells, so our cuboidal and our columnar. Now, when we're looking for our uh, carcinoma, so besides adenocarcinoma, so basal cell, right? What sort of morphology do we see here? What? So it's gonna be in tandem with the skin, right? So we don't see any sort of raised, so what do we call that? <coughs> superficial, right? So superficial means, right, I see the impacted area, but it's plush with the skin. What about this guy? Nodular, right, so usually most common. So we see the raised lumps, so that will be our nodular morphology. This one, do you remember this? So technically, right, it does have a little bit of a raise, but it looks a lot worse than this. So do we remember what to call this one? It's our hybrid, right? So our hybrid is our basosquamous. So it's both basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And then lastly, right, what looks like scar tissue? Morphoic, right? So morphoic usually presents white, it presents a little bit of shine to it, so typically it looks like scar tissue. <coughs> okay, so basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. Now, we already mentioned the differences in their, uh, where they're impacted, right? So stratum basal is going to be basal cell. Anything above that is going to be squamous cell carcinoma. Um, what do we know about uh, maybe growth rate? So which of these is a little bit worse? Do we know? Squamous cell, right? So squamous cell typically grows a little bit faster, a little, little bit harder to treat than basal cell. Basal cell is very, very slow growing. Okay, so if we have cancer impacting our cartilage, our hyaline, right, cartilage, our fibrocartilage, elastic usually does not get cancer, but those two, what would we call that? Chondro. What? What's after that? Chondrosarcoma. Right, so chondrosarcoma. Good. Cancer of skeletal muscle. Rhabdomyo. Right, so all these are going to be some form of sarcoma. So, rhabdo for voluntary skeletal, myo for muscle. 
cancer arising from fibrocytes. So if we know that these guys are making collagen, right, it would be fibrosarcoma, right? So we get the name from there. Cancer of vasculature. Angio, right, so angiosarcoma, good. Okay, so John says that he was recently diagnosed with kidney cancer. What types of cancer could his be? And then out of those options, statistically, which one is most likely? So uh, this is again, right, we have to understand all sorts of tissue that are in this organ. So you gotta rely on all the knowledge that you've gotten from anatomy from this. So kidney, what's inside the kidney? What could one cancer be? Adenocarcinoma, right? So renal adenocarcinoma, definitely, right? It's full of uh, ducts. We got a whole bunch of those um, uh, cuboidal cells. What else could there be? Angiosarcoma. Angiosarcoma, good, right? So we could have vasculature, right? We saw that there's vasculature that goes inside the kidney. What else could we have? What are renal corpuscles? What sort of cells are they? Squamous. If I have squamous cells, right, what could I end up having? Squamous cell carcinoma, right? Rel very rare, but we could have renal squamous cell carcinoma. Anything else? Those are three really good options. No smooth muscle in the kidney. We have smooth muscle a little bit outside. But what about, there's one other option that's a little bit harder to think of. What a, uh, so if you work your way out, right? Do we remember what the capsule of the kidney is? What is a kidney capsule? If you don't know, right, usually there's a backup that everything is. Is a kidney capsule muscle? No. It's what? Connective tissue, right? So everything in the body, if it's not an epithelium, it's not a muscle, it's usually going to be connective tissue. What is a connective tissue? A lot of connective tissue. <coughs> Collagen. Right, so most connective tissue, as long as you're not talking about cartilage or fat or anything like that, the capsule is composed of collagen. So do you guys see what I'm trying to get you to say? What do we think? Renal fibrosarcoma, right? Because if that capsule is made up of connective tissue, made up of collagen, we're gonna have fibrocytes, right? So we have to understand, right, all the different kind of uh, cells that are inside of an organ. So we could have cancer that impacts all of those. Now statistically, which of these is most likely? So typically, nearly all kidney cancer presents as one type. Which of those is gonna be probably what he has? Adenocarcinoma, right? So nearly all kidney cancers are adenocarcinoma because you have so many of those tubes, right? So your proximal convoluted tubule, your distal convoluted tubule. When you take a cut in the collecting tubes, when you take a cut of that kidney, you see tubes everywhere. So statistically, it's nearly gonna be adenocarcinoma. Okay, osteosarcoma. So how does osteosarcoma differ from Ewing's sarcoma? So both of these affect the bone, right? But they are different. So how do we have differences in the two? What are the cells impacted by osteosarcoma? Osteoblast, osteocytes. So we your bone cells, right? So your osteocytes in general. What are the cells impacted in Ewing's sarcoma? Stem cells, right? So the stem cells that are inside of the bone, right? So even though they're both considered a bone cancer, we have different cells that are gonna be impacted. Do we remember what causes Ewing sarcoma? So it's, we found, right, a specific link to Ewing sarcoma. So do we remember what that is? So it's gonna be genetic based, right? So this is one of our cancers that is uh, very closely linked to translocation of genes. You guys remember, so we have genes 22 and 11. It's when we have a chunk of 22 that gets put on 11 and it creates this hybrid protein that excessively causes proliferation. So that those chromosome um, translocation is linked to this cancer. Okay, so this is gonna be fun. So we're gonna work our way from easiest to maybe more difficult. So we have a very general picture here, right, of a tumor. So this is taken from one of your slides. So technically this is considered a, a lipoma, but we're gonna roll with it because we don't know that yet. So if we get told this is a cancer of stratum spinosum cells, what would this cancer be? 
If I have cancer that's arising from stratum spinosum, where is stratum spinosum? It's in the skin, it's a layer of the skin, right? As long as you don't hear the word basal, what does that mean? Squamous cell carcinoma, right? So this individual would have squamous cell carcinoma if that is the layer being impacted. If it is stratum basal, basal cell carcinoma, right? Non-cancerous tumor of fat, what do we call it? Lipoma, right? Cancerous tumor of fat, what do we call that? Use your terminology. So liposarcoma, right? So technically we didn't cover, but you guys know the nomenclature, oma versus sarcoma. So if this is considered cancer, it would be a liposarcoma. Ooh, okay, so instead, this is a cancer of flexor carpi ulnaris. Why does that sound familiar? What would we call that? Rhabdomyosarcoma, right? We know from last semester muscles. So we've got the flexors in here. And then we know that all of these muscles are volunteers. <coughs> They're skeletal muscles. So this would be considered uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. And then lastly, we could even say this is a cancer of the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris. What do we think? What's a tendon? Well, what is it? another C word, right? Tendons and ligaments. Are they muscles? No. They'll attach, you know, some of them will attach to muscles, but they're not considered muscles, so what are they? They're connective tissue, specifically what? They're nothing but collagen, right? So your tendons and your ligaments are your dense, regular connective tissue. So if this is a cancer of collagen, then we have what? Fibrosarcoma. Right? So we have to understand where the cancer is arising from. So where the tumor actually is in the body. Okay, beautiful picture. So what do we have here? First, what cancer is this displaying? Lymphoma, but you'll have to be more specific. Hodgkins or not Hodgkins? Hodgkins, right, because these cells, they're full, so we call them, we shorten them to say Reed Sternberg cells, but their full name tells you the disease. Their full name is Hodgkin Reed uh, Sternberg cells. So that means that you have Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, um, do we remember what these cells actually are? What have they mutated from? What were they originally? B cells, right, so they're B cells, because we remember lymphoma is B and T cell cancer. So these used to be B cells, right? This is their characteristic shape by having two nuclei, very big. We can have like a mononucleistic uh, morphology or like mummified, so there's different variants, but this is kind of your indicator that you're looking at Hodgkin's lymphoma. What did we talk about for our prevalence? So if you take a biopsy, right, and you see a bunch of these Hodgkin uh, Reed Sternberg cells, what does that tell you about the cancer? other than what you have. Progression. progression, right? It's directly linked to the progression of the cancer. So if you see a lot of them, that typically means that you're a little bit more advanced in your staging. Okay, and then just for, is that gonna be a little bit more rare or more common than non-Hodgkin? Which of the two is more common to have? Non-Hodgkin. Non-Hodgkin usually affects older people, but it's the more common of the two. Okay, so fast aggressive cancer that forms from stem cells that give rise to basophils. So very wordy, but what are we saying? So if I am a cancer of a progenitor cell that would give rise to a basophil, what do we think? It's what type of leukemia? Acute myeloid. Myeloid, right. So we have to be a little bit more specific than that. So it is a myeloid leukemia, but what is this telling us? Fast aggressive. What does that mean? Acute, right? So full name, acute myeloid leukemia. So we have to remember, right, myeloid gives rise to everything other than our B and our T cells. So if this guy is giving rise to basophils, he'd be in that myeloid progenitor range. Okay, so benign tumors and cancerous tumors, we saw there are many different qualities, right, that differentiate them. So let's list out four. So what's one of the easiest to mention? What do they look like? A capsule, right? So benign tumors have a capsule, right? Malignant tumors don't. What else can we have? 
invasive versus non-invasive. So the ability to metastasize, right? What else? No what? No vasculature. So if you cut into a benign tumor, it typically does not bleed. If you cut into a malignant tumor, it usually has blood vessels all throughout so it will bleed. What else do we have? Those are three of kind of the biggest. Can we think of any more? So what about maybe the speed of replication? Which of these is a little bit faster? Okay, right, malignant. Usually they have a higher mitotic index than our own benign ones. Um, reoccurrence. So if I get these tumors taken out, which of them has a chance of coming back? Malignant, right. So usually if you're encapsulated, <coughs> you just take out the capsule. As long as you've taken out the entire capsule, you're good. So there's quite a, a lot of different qualities from that chart. Okay, so this is a broad statement. How are cancer cells able to metastasize? So before we get into blood vessels, right, if we're thinking about this chronologically, first, I gotta make sure that I break away from my tumor. So how are cancer cells able to break away from their tumor? They don't have adhesion molecules, right? And they lose their gap junctions. So if I lose those junctions that are physically connecting me to my neighbors, it's a lot easier for me to be able to break away. Now, after I've done that, right, how, uh, how do I get into the vasculature? So how do we actually spread? What allows them to go into the vasculature? You remember? So they have right special enzymes that allow them to break down basement membranes. What do we call them? Just the general term, protease, okay. right? So e ASE means to break down, right? It's an enzyme to break down proteins. So proteases help to break down the basement membrane. And then aside from that, we also know that they don't make normal vasculature to begin with. So we'll talk about that in a little bit later. But all of those factors contribute to their ability to metastasize. Now, why are they considered immortal? So aside from like physical trauma that will obviously still kill them, why are they considered immortal? They're, they have active telomerases, right? An active telomerase is never supposed to be active in a healthy cell, unless it's a stem cell or a uh, germ cell. So active telomerases will refill the telomere caps on their chromosomes so that when their telomere caps get shortened, they can just tack on more and more and more um, telomeres. So they're considered uh, replicated uh, uh, immortal. Okay, vascular endothelial growth factor does what? What is that protein involved in? Don't think too hard, right, because it tells you in the name. As long as you understand the name, what is the process that it will help out? I'm growing something, what am I growing? The vasculature, right? So vascular endothelial growth factor functions in, functions in angiogenesis, correct? So these guys, the tumor cells, will secrete this so that we get proliferation of the endothelial cells, so we get more blood vessels, but also we recruit more stem cells to become endothelial cells. So we're getting kind of signals from two different locations to come and promote more vasculature um, formation. And then to piggyback off of that, what are the capillaries that are made when we signal this growth factor? Sinusoidal, right, we have to understand the implications of that, right? So if I make sinusoidal capillaries, they're fenestrated, they have holes in them, so it's a lot easier for tumor cells to come in and to, to leave. Okay, so how do cancer cells sustain proliferation in the <coughs> absence of external growth factors? So even if I, as the body, are not sending out growth factors, how do cancer cells still divide? There's a lot of contributing factors, but one of them, so if I'm not giving growth factors to the tumor, why does the tumor not care? What can it do? It can make its own. It makes its own growth factors that use autocrine signaling. So I can secrete this protein that can literally just come right back to me and bind to my surface or the surface of all the other tumor cells. So they don't care if we don't make growth factors for them because they will make them themselves. Okay, so we also saw, right, reprogramming of the immune system. So why do we promote high levels of regulatory T cells? 
Why do I favor these white blood cells over others? Why do you mention them? They trick the body. They trick the body by, right, we have to remember the function. So regulatory T cells help end the immune response. So if I have a whole bunch of regulatory T cells in the environment, it's tricking the body to say, hey, there's nothing to see here, right? So we have ended an immune response. You can call off all the other white blood cells that could potentially bind us. And then we also saw that we can ignore death, right? So even if a cancer cell gets signals to go through apoptosis, why can a cancer cell choose to ignore it? Well, it doesn't really choose, it just can't. So why, do we, uh, why are we not able to go through apoptosis? What are we missing that is critical for apoptosis? It's a specific family of proteins, right? caspases caspase they're considered executioner proteins so if i am making a mutated caspase that's no longer functional i cannot follow through with that pathway so even if i get apoptotic signals i can't induce apoptosis okay if i am considered stage two cancer so not grade two but stage two what does that tell me about the extent of the cancer? So staging is basically how far we spread. So do we remember what stage two means? So stage one, right, usually is very beginning. So right, you find one spot. So how, what's the next level up? It's spreading in certain areas of the same organ, right? So we're still localized. We are still in the same organ, but we now have multiple spots. Okay, so now we're going to shift. So we understand, right, the ins and outs of cancer. Like I told you guys the very first day, the module, especially that first PowerPoint, lends very well with flashcards, just drilling, right, what sorts of cancers and their nomenclature. So now we're gonna look at some of our lab structures. So we're gonna see if we are ready. Now we should know these structures because we've already had a lecture exam on them. So I have my beautiful kidney, right? We know that we're gonna have to have all the structures plus all the vasculature just like how we did for lecture. So vasculature, I'm starting, let's just go with our arteries, right? How do we get into the kidney? We have renal, right? We're then gonna branch into what? Segmental, right, then we go between the pyramids, so we call this what? Low bar, right, enter low bar. We're gonna arch into arcuate, and then we go out, interlobular or cortical radiate, right? So we radiate out and then cortical radiate, good. Now, what else can I see? So, we have our vasculature. Microscopically, what vasculature goes inside of the renal corpuscle? Afferent arterial, right? And then we leave via efferent. So we can also see our different regions. So what is the uh, outer portion of the kidney? Cortex. And then we have medulla, right? We can even see the capsule over here. Uh, our pyramids are going to drain into bumps, which are those papilla, right? Which then drain into what? What are these guys? Calyx. So a calyx is specifically a minor calyx, right? We're then going to drain into a major. And then what do we drain into? The pelvis, right? The renal pelvis. And then what is structure three? Ureter. Good. What else can we see on here? So this is tiny, but what is what is all of this? All together, a nephron, right? Nephron functional unit of the kidney. What is this? A collecting duct, right? That goes down and drains down. So we're familiar, right, with the ins and outs of the kidney. Now, if we take a bigger picture, right? So we're looking at our <coughs> renal corpuscle. So if we are just going to identify the circle here, what would we call that? Glomerulus, right? So that is the filtration part. So that's the vast, the capillary bed for filtration. So I have my glomerulus. What about all these little guys over here? Podocytes, right? They help make that filtration barrier. What about just this? These cells. So that space is created by what? Bowman capsule, right? The Bowman capsule, and then technically this is the Bowman space. But Bowman's capsule, right? You sit the glomerulus inside. Together, it is a renal corpuscle. We already saw our afferent arterial. So we know that this is afferent because it's got these specialized cells, this engorgement, right? 
What is this region called? Regulates blood pressure. Juxtaglomerular apparatus, right? So we have the juxtaglomerular apparatus, specifically these engorged cells, JG cells, right? So the juxtaglomerular cells, you can also call them other names, but that's most common. What about the bottom portion of this? What are they called? <coughs> Macula densa, right? So the juxtaglomerular apparatus is gonna be our juxtaglomerular cells, our JG cells with our macula densa. What is this actual structure altogether? What is this tube? Distal convoluted tubule, right? So if this is distal, that means this is proximal. So we can see that this is clearly attached to that Bowman's capsule. So that means that this has to be proximal. We also know that this is a great view of proximal convoluted tubule because I get to see all of that microcilia, right? So all those tiny, tiny cilia that's so good at reabsorbing things. <coughs> So I think we've covered we've covered that structure pretty well. So a ferret, e ferret, and our nomenclature for that. Okay, what do we have? All right, switching it up. We have what uh, organ is this? Ovary. Right. So we have to know, just like in lecture, all the stages of follicular development as well as uh, oogenesis. So from here, right. What are we starting with, these guys, both on in both areas? What follicle? Primordial, Primordial follicle, <laughs> right. And then what would we classify the egg inside? A primary primary oocyte, right? So primordial follicle, primary oocyte. We're now going to shift to this one over here. What, what follicle? Primary. primary follicle, primary oocyte, beautiful. Now, for those of you who are still going through lab this week, you'll hear it, but this guy, gives a little bit of confusion for students. So what I want you to see first, I see even though it's, it's pixelated from being blown up, there's stratification, right? Which means it's at least secondary because I see stratification, but I want all of you to see this black <laughs> line, okay? This black line might not look like anything at first, but it is the starting of what? An antrum. Right, so we know that an antrum is gonna end up being forming so that we have specifically, right, we can fill it up with that serous fluid. So this little tiny line is the start, it's a little hole that is starting the antral formation. So what do we call this? What would the correct name for this follicle to be? <coughs> antral follicle. It's a very early antral follicle, really, really, really early antral follicle, but once I see that antrum starting, we can classify that as an antral. Now, after we go through antral, so technically we don't really have a secondary. This is kind of a merge between secondary and antral. So after that, we get to this very, very late stage. What do we call a mature follicle? Brathian, right? So this is physically in the process of ovulation, correct? So all of this is the antrum, which would be filled with fluid. Now, what follicle do we progress to after this one? What do you think? After I ovulate, what's gonna happen? Purpura hemorrhagica, right? So I rupture some blood vessels, right? After that, what forms? Corpus luteum, luteal for yellow, right? So this is our one that's kind of a transient. It sticks around, right? Depending on if we're pregnant or not. So this one is giving us that progesterone. Now, once it degrades, what are we now forming? Albicans, right? Which will then just degrade into scar tissue. So just get rid of. Now, did you guys notice, right, so for those of you who have already had a lab, you are going to know what I'm talking about, but for those who haven't, did we notice that I did not say anything about this guy, right? For those of you in the lab, do you remember why we showed you this follicle or what the name of this is? It looks very deceptive because it looks like the same thing as this, right? So at first glance, they look very similar, but they are not. So, for those of you who have had lab, you've heard this one is considered an atretic follicle. So what is an atretic follicle? Do we remember? So we talked about in lecture, right? We have like over uh, 1.5 million follicles at birth, right? Do all of those go through maturation? No. An atretic follicle is a follicle that's not going to go through maturation or it stopped in a process for whatever reason. So when you guys look in lab this week at this model, because it's the same model, I want you guys to notice that if you look into this follicle, there's actually no egg. 
So it's just an empty follicle. So this guy is not gonna be able to go through the entire maturation process. There's something wrong with it. It doesn't even have an egg inside. So it's considered an atretic follicle. All right, other things we can see. What region is this? Where do we have our vasculature? Medulla, right? So just like a kidney, we have medulla and then our follicles are gonna be in our cortex. Okay, so really good picture. We've got the uterus. So let's do the uterus first. So inside lining, what, what do we call that? Endometrium, right. So we saw from lecture, not all of it gets shed. So what is the portion that's getting shed? Functional layer, right? So functional layer gets shed, that basal layer will stay by. What about all of this? Myometrium for muscle, and then the last kind of lining, hard to see, but it's going to be peri, right? So we have our layers of the uterus. What else can I look at? Of course, we have my ovaries. Do we remember the ligament that holds them in place? Ovarian. Ovarian, right? So very similar. Uh, what about this? Fallopian tube with fimbriae. Good. And so we saw, I was very sad, very disheartened to see so many people say fertilization occurs in the uterus on the exam. So we know fertilization occurs in the fallopian tube, right? We see it happening right over here. Um, what else do we have? So vaginal canal, right? What about these regions? So this together, what is this? So it's the cervix, right? The region of the cervix here and here. So this side is what? External os internal os, right? So the cervix has different openings. So the uterine side is going to be internal os. The vaginal side will be our external os. Okay. All right. So our lovely testes model. Now let's see, let's do our connective tissue. So the connective tissue, the capsule of the testes, what do we call that? What tunica? There's only two options. Is it albuginia? Does what it look white? Vaginalis. vaginalis, right? So the blue will be vaginalis. Albuginia divides all of these little lobes. So these are basically um, uh, uh, the lobules, right, inside of the testes. So tunica albuginia is going to be separating them. So inside these lobes, what do we call these ramen noodles? Seminiferous tubules, right? So seminiferous tubules we have to trace out. So as we mature, we go out, we go out. What is over here? Reedy testes, right? Reedy testes is then going to go into efferent duct. So we're leaving, therefore efferent. And then as we, right, we almost hit that maturity, we're then going to go into here, which is what? Epididymis. Good. And then you can even see the pictures cut off, but it does lead into the vas deferens. Okay. So on this model, right, we got a lot of stuff working for us. So let's do our, okay all together. So if on the exam, we have a circle around all of this. What would you call this? If we grab the entire thing, Sperm. spermatic cord, right? So the spermatic cord is three structures. I know the muscle, which is all of this pink is going to be what? Premaster, right? Regulating that temperature, um, regulation for the testes. My vasculature is called what? Pampiniform plexus, right? It's everywhere when you look at it histologically. And then, right, the, the kind of the important one that we can see peeking out is what? Vas deferens, right? So all together, they are the spermatic cord. Now, other things I can see if we follow down, I see this over here, right? Epididymis. And then, of course, we have the testes. What about the skin? Scrotum. Scrotum. Good. Uh, regions, what do we call this portion of the penis? Glands, Glands right. And I think should be good for for this model. We've of course got our bladder. What about these? What are these? Ureters, right. Okay, <coughs> speaking of bladder, so this is standard, right? Standard, very standard bladder model. So what can I see? The first thing, right, you, your TAs probably have told you, you will have to be able to sex the models, meaning that you'll have to be able to identify their sex. Is this male or female? Yeah. Male. Why do I know that? Prostate, as well as those um, seminiferous uh, seminal vesicles. So seminal vesicles, right? Dead giveaway, as well as the prostate. When I look at this prostate, what is this? Ejaculatory duct, right? What do we call this? Prostatic urethra, right? What epithelia do I have up in here? Transitional, right? We have. Uh, if I am a distended bladder, 
am I empty or full? If I'm distended, I'm full. Right, so my epithelia should be more tiny. The muscles themselves are also contracted and smaller. A contracted bladder will be an empty bladder. What sort of cells top my transitional epithelia? Umbrella cells, right. So they're usually on top of those cork cells. Um, let's see. So what else can we have? What structure, microscopically, is in here that is a giveaway that you're in the prostate? We'll see it a little bit later, but what is a gauge of age? I don't know if your TA has told you this, but there's something that men get more of as they age that's inside the prostate. The Latin, so corpora amylacea, right? You can also opt out and say prostatic concretion. So corpora amylacea calcifications of the prostatic fluid, because we know that this is considered a accessory gland, right, for semen production. Okay, so real exam <coughs> questions. Now, obviously, these are not from your exam, because we have not made it yet, but it's from a previous semester. So, ID the structure at the tip of the pointer. What do we have? What do we think? So, there's two structures that almost look like this. So I see, right, a tiny lumen and a bunch of muscle. So what do you think this could be? <coughs> you got it, be confident. <coughs> Vas deferens, right. Vas deferens. Now I could also understand if you wanted to say ureter, because ureter also presents with a star-shaped lumen. However, a ureter is much larger than the, the vas deferens. So this is really tiny. This will be the vas deferens with all that smooth muscle. Now, another way that you can identify that this is the vas deferens is the surrounding environment. I see all of this vasculature, right? All of this blood supply. So what is that? Pimpiniform plexus, beautiful. So is the structure found in male or female reproductive systems? Male, of course, right? So make sure that you are able, right, to understand what we're looking at. Okay, so a beautiful picture. A structure at the tip of the pointer. So, what would we call this? Bowman's, Bowman's capsule, right. So if we drew a line or a circle for the entire thing, so if we printed this out and we circled the whole thing, then what would we be asking for? Renal corpuscle, right, whole thing. But technically this is just pointing to the Bowman's capsule. Um, what epithelia is this? We know what is filtration. I've said it a thousand times. Simple squamous, right? Simple squamous is for filtering the blood. Um, what is our epithelia over here? Everywhere else. Simple cuboidal, right? For absorption and secretion. Okay, so this one might be a little bit harder because it's this week's material. So for those of you who have taken lab, this organ, does anyone have any guesses for what this organ is? The uterus. The uterus. How do we know that this is the uterus? What, gave it, what gives it away? The glands, so one of the ways that we know that this is the uterus, this is a late stage uterus. So this is, um, I don't wanna, oh, okay, it's not on the second page. So this is considered a late stage uterus, meaning that it's in the secretory cycle because my glands are considered corkscrew. So we see the glands are getting a lot bigger, they're getting longer, and they kind of twirl like a, um, like a wine opener. So they're considered corkscrew shape. So we can also see, um, if you look really hard, and it might be a little bit better on the PowerPoint, but all of this pink inside is they're filling with fluid. So that's when you really know that you've hit the secretory phase of the uterine cycle. Now, we already know the answer to B. So as long as we can identify that this is the uterus, we should be able to understand, right, we're gonna have the endometrium, myometrium, and perimetrium. Okay, so what is this that we were just talking about? So we just mentioned this, what is this? It's very geometrical, looks like a GM that you cut open. What first, what tissue are we in? We're in the prostate. How do I know that this is a prostate? What are all of these guys? That corpora amylacea that we just mentioned, right? So in the prostate, the giveaway is the presence of these corpora amylacea. So I put this up just so that you guys could see a bigger version of what these actually are. So again, they're calcifications of the prostatic fluid. Okay, so what organ? Testes. How do I know that this is not the epididymis?
epididymis. Because epididymis can look similar. So why is this not the epididymis? So yes, but how do we really know that we're not looking at the mature spermatozoa? So a better way of visually identifying it is, I don't see those tall columnar cells, right? The epididymis is characterized by having beautiful epithelia that outlines each tube. So um, <coughs> if you don't see that tall columnar, then you're in the testes. So yes, you're not gonna have spermatozoa here, right? So all of these little developing cells are gonna be anywhere from spermatogonia all the way from spermatid. What other cells do I have in here other than germ cells? No, be more specific, in here, in here. Is it lytic cells? No. Sertoli, right, Sertoli cells are nurse cells. They nourish the sperm. Over here, right, everywhere that's not in the tubes, we have our lytic cells. What are they doing? Producing testosterone, beautiful. Okay, so identify structure A. What would we say? Nipple, right. So what about uh, the bumps, all of these guys? So you can either say are um, um, areolar glands or you can also say glands of Montgomery. So both of those are valid. Do we remember the function of these? Lubricant, right? So they're sebaceous glands, they secrete oil, um, help out in, in bleeding. That's not a mammary gland, no. Mammary glands inside. Okay. Okay, most immature sperm stage. Spermatogonia, right? Most mature. Spermatozoa, right? That should be very fresh in our mind. Okay, I think this is the last picture. So beautiful. So first, what organ are we looking at? Ovaries, right? So we can see different stages of follicular development in here, right? So, or and then of course this is not the ovary. We'll talk about that in a bit. But these two are ovaries. So first, can we take a gander or a guess at what this is? What sort of follicle? What would I describe this as? Secondary, right? I see the stratification, but I don't see any holes. So I have a secondary follicle. I'm gonna have my what type of egg? Primary. Primary, right? So even though it's a secondary follicle, that egg does not become secondary until you're in that graphian, right? So the tail end of antral into graphian. So we have secondary up here. If we go over one, what are all of these little guys? Primordial, Primordial right? You can see some that are trying to shift um, some that are requiring a little bit more primordial cells, but for the most part, these are mainly primordial cells. And then this one is kind of an early secondary. So, um, we understand, right, ovaries. Uh, now, this is also this week. So, do we have any guesses of what this tissue is? What do we think? It's breast, right? It's a mammary gland. So, for this week for mammary glands, you guys have two different versions, right? You have senile versus lactating. So remember, senile does not mean old, it just means that you're not pregnant or conceivably pregnant. So do we ha have any guesses on if this is senile or lactating? Senile. senile, right? So you're doing that by the ratio of connective tissue. I see a whole bunch of collagen. My uh, The actual glandular tissue is relatively small. So this will be a senile breast. All right, so that's gonna wrap up absolutely everything that